These beads are handmade. The person who worked on them had a specific customer in mind. I am not your typical customer. I bought these in North Africa. The person who will buy these is a devout Muslim, someone involved in the ritual of Salat. There are 33 beads on this chain designed to recite the 99 beautiful names of God. They will go through the beads three times, going one bead at a time, saying Ar-Razzaq, Al-Bari, Al-Muhaymin, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. They do this to show that they are pious. They do it at a bus stop, they do it waiting for the train, they do it smoking. It becomes a habit. Really, they're not thinking about the names of God. It becomes just a ritual to show people around them that they are pious. Rituals are nice, but they cannot be used to control God. Piety is commendable, but without a power to live a holy life and a relationship with God, it means nothing. Bonjour, je suis d'une Tunisienne. Et je suis chrétienne depuis un an et deux mois presque. J'ai une grande histoire avec Jésus. Depuis mon enfance, euh, j'ai une idée non, pas déterminée sur la vie de, de Jésus, le, qui est le fils de, la, de Marie la Vierge. Euh, toujours j'ai une question, à quoi sert cette histoire Pourquoi est fait le croix c'est quoi cette histoire Je cherche la vérité, je cherche la vérité de cette histoire. Et lorsque j'ai 13, 13 ans, j'allais pas mal de fois au, à l'église cathédrale catholique de Tunis et toujours je cherche euh, le Bible pour... Euh, pour trouver la vérité, pour, tra pour tra tra trouver la, la réalité, pour euh, trouver des réponses sur mes questions. Parce que, parce que l'événement de Jésus n'a pas clair au Coran. Et il n'y a pas de, de réponse exacte. Et euh, j'allais toujours, toujours à l'église catholique. Et je ne trouve rien. Il n'y a pas de personne. Et lorsque j'ai 21, euh, j'ai trop. Je prends, je prends euh, un évangile jaune et euh, je dis je suis convaincante l'histoire et j'ai eu mille <coughs> après après les, la lecture de cet évangile je trouve encore des, des questions pour euh, pour, euh, pour résoudre et tout le, et tout le temps j'ai posé des questions des, des gens chrétiens et chaque jour, je suis convainc convaincante, encore. Et une fois, j'arrive à une, 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 une point que, que je suis satisfaite de la réalité. Je touche la réalité maintenant. J'ai 22 ans lorsque j'ai... Je, je me sens ça. Après une grande recherche, après une grande enquête euh, sur la Bible, sur le, 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 le foi, la foi de chrétien, de Christ, euh, je me suis rassurée. Je me, suis, je me sens bien mon existence et pourquoi j'existe. Après, je, je priais le, la prière de, de la foi de Christ et 
mais deviennent pratiquants, deviennent, euh, même je fais des études sur euh, la Bible, je fais des, euh, des leçons euh, concernant le Christ pour améliorer mes connaissances, pour améliorer euh, ma foi et pour, euh, et pour que je travaille au nom de notre Seigneur. Now, what do Muslims believe and what do Muslims practice? You might meet a Muslim who says to you, Islam is an easy religion. Look at your hand, you have five fingers in each hand. So we have five things we believe in and five things that we do, which we call rituals or pillars of Islam. The first five things they believe in are called pillars of faith. So the first one is Allah, worship of one God, worship of Allah. Allah is from the Aramaic and Hebrew root of Eloh, meaning one God or God. And Allah in, in Arabia was the name used to refer to God by Jews and Christian. Because we're not going to use the word God, G-O-D, it's English. Now how do you know God in Islam? They tell you, you know God through His beautiful names. So they like to teach each other the 99 beautiful names of God. In reality, in the Quran, there are 104 names. But Muslims like the number 99, it's a magical number. What are the names of God? They become more of a characteristic. For example, Allahul Bari means God the Creator. Allahul Quddus, God is Holy. Allahul Rahim, God is Merciful. We like a lot of these names as Christians because they agree with us. Three names disagree with us. One is Al Mumit, meaning God is the source of death. We disagree on that. We believe that death entered the world because of sin. And God is good, and He's good all the time. He is the giver of life. So in Islam, God is the source of death. The second name we disagree on is Al-Muntaqim, meaning the avenger. It, when you read the verse and you study, you find out that what the Quran and the teaching of Muhammad says, that God comes after you in vengeance. Different than what we look at it out of justice. Some might like to say, no, we look at it as justice. But generally, they see that God is vengeful. And they go as far as say that God loves only the Muslims and does not love anyone else. But that's different than our perspective on that God loves everyone because we all sin and fall in short. But so we, do, we disagree on the Mumit, we disagree on the Muntakim. And the third one we have a real issue with as Christians is Al Makr. The Quranic verse says, Wala tamkaru ala Allahi, inna Allaha khayrul makirin means do not scheme against God because God is the best schemer. So in Islam today, God is sovereign. He is the source of good and evil. He can do whatever He wants. So when you ask a good Muslim, are you going to heaven? They say, inshallah, I hope so, if God wills. Why? Because even if He was a good Muslim, God can change His mind. So what happens in Islam is you are not sure. You cannot trust God. God can be both evil and good. So they're always worried. Even when we study the rituals of Islam, you find most Muslims do the rituals to protect themselves from the wrath of God and get the blessings of God, which is a totally different understanding of God from the Bible, where we look at God as Heavenly Father, as the giver of good things, as giver of life, of changing the bad to the good. So it's important to understand that the, the difference between Islam and Christianity is not that we worship one God. No, we both worship one God. The difference is the character. So Allah in the Bible is different than Allah in the Quran. God in the Bible is different than God in the Quran. We should not fall into the semantic game. We should not say Allah is not God. The real name of God is Yahweh. When Moses asked God what is the name, he said Yahweh, which is really not a noun, it's a verb, I am. So if you say Yahweh is not Allah, okay. But if you say Allah is not God, it doesn't make sense because God is English from Germanic root, which was a pagan deity. 
So let's not fall into the trap as Allah God. When I'm talking in Muslim and Arabic, I use Arabic, Allah. If I'm talking in English, I use God. If he says he wants to use the word Allah, I say, fine, let's, take, let's talk about Allah. Who is Allah? And lead him to understand Allah in the Bible, not only Allah in the Quran. But well, the basic belief to be to be a true Muslim, you have to submit. Islam it means submitting to God. That's what Muslim means. The only one God. We believe in just one God. He's the creator. We we are we are He's the creator and we are like His slave. So the first thing you should believe in is Allah, one God. Number two is they must believe in his angels, and that includes demons and jinn. Angels are created from light, uh, demons are created from fire, and then jinn, that's genies. There are 40 types of jinn in the Quran, and they are half demonic, half human, and they can strike you. So many times you'll be talking to a Muslim and they're afraid of jinn. I was visiting a restaurant, the owner is a Syrian, and while I was talking to him, he looked at his waiter and he said in Arabic, where is so-and-so? So the waiter said, he's in the back doing a wasfi. Wasfi means an incantation to ward off jinn. So I said to the owner, are you having a jinn problem in the restaurant? He says, no, nothing, nothing. I said, if you'd like, I can pray in the name of Jesus and God will bless your store. At that moment, he says, please, whatever you do, don't pray here. I said, it's okay. I'm going to walk across the street and I pray for your restaurant. I did. I pray that God will bless his store, that will cleanse it from any evil spirits. I don't believe in jinn, but I believe there is a demonic activity. And I came back, chatted with him a little bit, and I told him, I pray that God will bless your store. A year later, I was at another restaurant and he was there with his wife and kids. He remembered me, shook my hand, uh, asked for a New Testament. Why? Because he saw that for me, all this uh, spiritual activity around me is based on my understanding of the Bible. Who is stronger? God is stronger. Jesus has conquered and he can, he can bless us in our time now, and bless our business and bless our families. So it was a good understanding that I gave him. I don't know what happened to him. I don't know if he's reading the Bible, but I did my part of showing God's strength. So they believe in God, in his angels, and then in his prophets. Many prophets in the Quran that are mentioned are the same like ours in the Old Testament. They don't have the stories or the details of their life, but they do uh, mention them by name. So Elijah, Elisha, Jonah is mentioned, which is great that we can utilize that story of Jonah to come to Christ. Uh, Job is mentioned. John the Baptist is mentioned as a prophet. You can always ask your Muslim friend, if John the Baptist is a prophet, what did John the Baptist come to do? And they might ask you, what did he come to do? Well, we have the answer in the, in the book of John of the New Testament. It says, he has come to prepare the way for the Messiah. Even the Quran says that Jesus was the Messiah of the Jewish people. So they understand that concept that we have in the Bible. It seems that Islam borrowed that from Christianity and added it to the Quran. So they believe Adam was a prophet. Noah was a prophet. Moses was a prophet. Jesus was a prophet. And Muhammad becomes the last one, the seal, they call it the seal. But then other cults in Islam, like the Baha'is, bring Abdul Baha. Then the Ahmadiyya bring Ghulam Ahmad. So not every Muslim you meet believes that Muhammad was the seal. But generally the Sunni teaching, the Orthodox teaching that Muhammad was the seal of the prophets. Some of the prophets we disagree as Christians. They say that Alexander the Great was a prophet. We have an issue with that according to his lifestyle. But beside the point, there are so many things that we agree on concerning the prophets. Then they say that God not only sent prophets, but he sent four messages. And the person who brings that becomes a Rasul, means holding a message, a messenger. So Muhammad's name is really not prophet. His name is a Rasul, means he has a message. What are the four messages that Islam must believe in? and obey. First message is a Taurat and it was given to Moses. Do they have it? No. It's mentioned in the Quran that they must believe in it. The second message is the Psalms of David. They call it Zabur. So God sends a Taurat of Moses, then the Psalms of David. 
The third message is the Injil, which means good news, and that's the book of Jesus. That's the New Testament. And then fourth is the Quran, the book of Muhammad. So all Muslims must believe that God sent the first message as Tawrat, as Zubur, the Psalms, and Injil, the New Testament of Jesus, and then the Quran, the book of Muhammad. The Imams teach them that the first one was sent and that was changed. So God sent the Psalms and that was changed. So God sends the Injil, the New Testament, and that was changed. So finally sends the Quran. So you ask him, excuse me, what if the Quran can be changed? They say, no, God keeps his word. Which really doesn't make sense because there were three messages first. If they were all corrupted before the Quran, then we cannot trust even the Quran. They must all be protected or none should be protected. Because God is stronger than man. But they always teach that God sent the four messages. The Imams tell them that they were changed except the Quran. The Quran itself never says that the word of God has been changed. Never. It never says that. In chapter 2 verse 136, the Quran says, Amanna, which means we believe of what God has sent through Moses and uh, Jesus and David. So we see that the Quran is on our side by saying to the Muslims, they must believe in the message of Moses, message of David, and the message of Jesus. So they must believe in God, in his angels, in his prophets, in his book, and finally in Judgment Day. Judgment Day is when everybody will raise from the dead and they will face judgment. Muslim Imams teach that God is a good businessman. You cannot cheat God. So on Judgment Day, life is a test. Your good works are put on one side of a scale and your bad works are put on the other side of the scale. Whichever way the scale tips, you go to heaven or to hell. In Islam, we do not have an answer. What if my good works and my bad works are 50-50? 50% of the equation. What if the scales are even? Where do we go? Heaven in Islam is a physical place where you eat and drink and uh, there's water and wine and honey and milk in paradise and there are women to take care of the male sexual pleasure. Hell is a place of fire, burning fire with wood and your skin will burn off and then God creates new skin to burn it over and again. So most Muslims today are so afraid of that day because even if you're a good Muslim, God can still change his mind because according to Islam, God is sovereign. He can do whatever he wants. In Christianity, God is holy. 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to do what? To forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's a promise. God will not change his mind. That's a promise that God will fulfill. In Islam, they don't know. They are not sure. So they believe in God, believe in the angels, believe in the prophets, believe in the books. But on judgment day, they are so afraid of that day to know that they do enough good works to cover their sins. But these are the five basic beliefs of Muslims. We'll talk about the pillars of Islam. The pillars of Islam are basically the five rituals of Islam. The first one is Ash-Shahada, which means to testify, which is the creed. The creed is to say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, which means there's no God except Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger. Once you say that in front of a Muslim, you've become a Muslim. That's all you have to do. You say it in front of a Muslim, you become a Muslim. And then you follow the life of Muhammad and the teachings of Muhammad. It becomes a magical statement. So you enter a home, it might be written on a uh, piece of paper and framed. It might be put in Arabic calligraphy. When a baby is born, they whisper in the ear, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. No God except Allah Muhammad is messenger. Once the baby is born, Islam has been decided for them. They have no other option. So you have to say that, and it becomes a magical statement that they recite all the time before prayer, after prayer, and it's very important to you to understand that the creed becomes 
a ritualistic thing. That's number one. It's called a shahada. The second thing they should do is called salat. Salat, the word salat was borrowed from the Christians, which means to bow down, to kneel. But in Islam, prayer is a ritual. It's a ceremony. It's a ceremony. You're really not talking to God because God is too busy. God is not communicating with you. Well, in Christianity, prayer is a conversation. You can speak to God anytime, anywhere. In Islam, no, there's a set time when you can do prayer. A set structure. So five times a day, you can do Salat. Sunrise, noon, afternoon, which is two hours after the noon hour, sunset, and then nighttime, which is two hours after the sunset. A Muslim has to face Mecca if they are in the west uh, of uh, Arabia, they go face east. If they are east of Arabia, they face west. They must do ablutions. Once they do ritual washing, they cannot touch a, a Jew, a Christian, a pagan, or a woman. They will defile them, which means they have to redo their ablutions again. And then once they stand up and recite, they kneel, they bow down, their knees must hit the ground, the palms, and then their forehead. And each prayer demands a number of kneelings. Some demand four, some demand three, some demand two. Tradition says Muhammad always added an extra kneeling. So what they will do is they will add an extra kneeling because remember, according to Islam, there are angels. Well, they say there's an angel on the right and an angel on the left. The angel on the right keeps track of the good works. And the angel on the left keeps track of your bad works. So what happens, you're showing the angel on the right to show that you did an extra kneeling. The first time, I don't know how to pray. There are seven years. My mom, she teach me and my cousin, my mom in uh, Iraq. You put it like, you know, the scarf. She put it for me and I don't know, I'm children, I put over there and I, I pray. Like how do my mama do like this? I'm looking at her, what she said and I, I'm saying. And she said, my mom, don't look into me, just to pray, put your head and sit i like, I don't know, I want to see how you're doing. <laughs> and I'm doing and I uh, said, no, this is haram. You have to respect the God. I'm like, okay. I don't know, because you know, seven years. Like, okay, I'm do them, I'm, I'm respect for you. There is a verse in the Quran, Ya Amanu, Ida Nudia, the Wasu, Ila Dikrilla. All who you believe, if the call comes for Friday prayer, live whatever you are doing, your work, your money, and everything, and go for the, after the call of prayer. Pray, then go to your life. So prayer comes first and life is second. So you do shahada in Islam, then you do salat, then you do psalm, fasting. Now fasting is in the month of Ramadan, or if you're speaking to somebody from um, Persian background, uh, it's, they call it Ramazan. Now, the month of Ramadan is a lunar month, which means um, it's a 28 days, and they fast. Absolutely, they do fast. And most Christians say, oh, they're fasting 28 days. In reality, they're not. According to Islam, Ramadan is the month of feasting. So you fast during the day, and you make up the meals during the night. So at sunset, you break fast by a date, a bowl of soup, and then vegetable dish, and a meat dish, and a lot of sweets, because you are celebrating the giving of the Quran. So for us, it's a month of fasting, because we think, oh, wait a second, when you fast, you don't make up the meals. No, in Islam, you switch day to night. That's all you do. And then at 2 o'clock, they have another meal, and then some will eat before they go to work. So you make up the meals, and the month of fasting is ended by the night of power or the night of destiny depending how you say it Layl al-Qadr or Layl al-Qadr but the night of destiny is very key for Muslims because at that night God might answer your prayers 
for the year. So what happens, most Muslims like to chant the Quran or listen to it chanted. Some will try to read it. And it's important that if you know someone who's fasting during Ramadan, that that evening, that night, you pray for them, that God will use that night to give them dreams, give them visions, send someone to talk to them, because that's the night they're really focusing on God and trying to see how much they can do to make God to answer their prayer. So they have to do Shahada, which is the reciting the creed, Salat, which is the prayer ceremony, Psalm, which is uh, fasting during the month of Ramadan, and then Zakat, which is alms to the needy. Uh, if you're a Sunni, you give 2.5%. If you're Shiite, you give 5%, and that's given to the needy. And then finally, Hajj. Hajj is like the highest thing they could do. And Muhammad asked that every Muslim has a pilgrimage to Mecca and Medina once in a lifetime. For any Muslim who is able to do the journey, they should do that. So every year, Mecca attracts 1.5 million people to come do this pilgrimage. When they get there, the men will shave their head, clip their fingernails, put a two-piece suit, wool suit, one to cover the top, one to cover the bottom. The women will wear a robe and they enter the big mosque and they go around the Kaaba, the square room, seven times from right to left, seven times. Um, uh, and as they go around it, they must touch the Kaaba or basically touch the black stone, which is a meteor that fell in Arabia before Islam. And the Arabs the, uh, who were pagan then thought it was a gift from the God of heaven. And they put it in the Kaaba. But as they go around the Kaaba, they must touch the stone or try to kiss it because Muhammad did that. So they go around the Kaaba and then they have other visiting spots where they rem remember the way Muhammad ran to Medina, how he came back, and they throw stones at the devil. Once you do this, you come back and you are called Hajji, which means someone who went to Hajj. I like to ask people who go to Hajj after they come back if they've had peace. And many times that will open a huge spiritual discussion. I have a friend who went to pilgrimage 21 times. He's now a believer in Jesus. I asked him why. He said, every time I went, I came back, I did not have peace. And I wanted to search for this inner peace and he found it in Christ. So the five things they have to do is one, is the creed, shahada. Two, salat, which is a prayer ceremony. Uh, three is Psalm, which is fasting during the month of Ramadan. Four, Zakat, which is alms the needy. And then the fifth um, ritual or pillar of Islam is Hajj, which is pilgrimage to Mecca and Medina, which are in Saudi Arabia. Once a Muslim performs these, then he is performing the rituals of his faith and he's pleasing God because all these will give him good points, good works that will hopefully erase the sins on Judgment Day. Now you've learned the basic Islamic beliefs and rituals. Let us keep in mind why we are studying these beliefs and rituals. It is because we want to understand our Muslim friends and know how to build bridges with them. You do not need to have a PhD in Islam to build a friendship with a Muslim. Connect with your Muslim friend. Ask questions. Be a learner. He might explain something about Islam that you did not know. She might explain an Islamic holiday. Great! Listen and learn. But be ready. They might ask you about your faith. Make prayer your preparation and go boldly. Remember, you do not need to be an expert in Islam. You need to be an expert in the gospel. You need to be an expert in knowing Jesus.